right, this morning we're going to be talking about children of God. And we're going to be in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Two things, two stories come to my mind. One day I was at Walmart with our daughter Jessica. And uh, there was this woman who used to work as a dietitian at the VA hospital. Her name was Trudy. And she knew my wife Trudy because at that point... Uh, we used, she used to take students from the high school out to the VA and they would give them some simple jobs to do. So Trudy and Trudy knew one another. Anyway, I'm walking through Walmart and my daughter Jessica had never met the other Trudy before in her life. All of a sudden, Trudy, the other Trudy, runs up, gives our daughter Jessica a big hug and said, You must be little Trudy! You have to be Trudy's daughter! <laughs> In other words, it wasn't just me she saw, but when she looked at Jessica, she saw Trudy. Now, another story. One day, our son-in-law, Rigo, uh, was with Annabelle at the store. And we have a friend by the name of Jan Anderson. Jan walked up behind Rigo and Annabelle and looked at Rigo and said, You've got to be married to Jennifer. This has got to be Jennifer's daughter. And Rigo took a look at her like, who are you? You know, and kind of took, grabbed a, a, a tighter hold uh, to, uh, to uh, Annabelle. And so Jan said, no, no, no. Uh, I knew your, 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 daughter, your wife when she was a little girl. And Annabelle looks just like Jennifer when she was little. So here are two cases when people met either our daughter or our granddaughter and knew who they were related to just by taking a look at them. Well, our key verse this morning is in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1a. By a, I mean the first part of the verse, where it says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. The point that we want to make simply is this. As believers, we have received new identities. We are children of God. And so the question that I want to ask myself is, when people look at me, do they know whose child I am? When they look at me, do they see Jesus? When they look at me, do they see God <coughs> living through me? When they see my actions, my behavior, my words, do they say, boy, you're a child of the Father? Or do they see something else? What do people see when they look at, at my life? And so then, I would say that you should be asking yourself the question, when they look at you, do they realize, based upon the way you live and the way you act, that you're a child of God? And so, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 this morning, talk about two different things. First of all, called children of God, and second of all, completed children of God. All right? There's a difference. First of all, we are called children of God. If you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, not only are your sins forgiven, not only do you have a place assured for you in heaven, but you've received a new identity. You've received a new name, a new label. You are a child of God. Now, that doesn't mean that we're perfect yet, but we're complete. We're going to talk about that in, in, in you know, a way. Obviously, we are, 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 we are in process, all right? But let's go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 again, where we're called children of God. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Now, the King James Version, that's the NIV Version, the King James Version uses the phrase, Behold what matter. It is of great benefit to the Christian to take a good, intense look at the love God has bestowed on us. In other words, when it says behold there, or we're, we're in the NIV version, it says how great this love is. The idea is we need to stop and think about it. Ponder it. And be impressed. And be overwhelmed that God the Father has literally lavished this love upon us. What does it mean to lavish? 
You know, if, if you, uh, had, let's say you, your hands are getting dry, I don't know about you, <coughs> this winter my hands got dry and cracked, even started to bleed. And so I got all sorts of goop to put on my hands and lotion to put on hand. It's one thing to put a tiny little drop on and to just rub it on and it disappears, all right? You're, you're, you're placing that on your hands. But to lavish would mean to pour a bottle in your hands, start rubbing, still, it's literally dripping everywhere. Okay. Your, your hands are actually soaking wet with, with that lotion. When God gave us love, he didn't give us just a tiny little bit. He literally lavished his love upon us so that we become new individuals. Now, when we see children of God, I'm going to date myself here, we are not talking about the cult from the 1970s founded by David Berg. David Berg was a nut, all right? And uh, he literally started what would be considered a hippie cult. It was a free love cult, and David Berg got a wife, and then he had all these other women and all these other children, and finally they ended up leaving the United States. I think they went to Thailand, where they could live in anonymity there. But they were literally a cult. Well, they were called the children of God. So I want to make sure that if you remember this group, when we say we're children of God, we're not talking about some sort of a cult. Now, Spurgeon says this. When, when, when John is saying, how great is the love the Father's lavished on us that we should be called children of God, he says, there, he says, you poor people that love me, you sick people, you unknown, obscure people without any talent. I have published it before heaven and earth and made the angels know it that you are my children. I am not ashamed of you. I glory in the fact that I have taken you for my sons and daughters. All right? Now, when we're talking about children of God here, there's something that we need to, uh, to differentiate. We're going to talk about that a little later. Now, you've heard the phrase, well, you know, we're all God's people. We're all God's children, meaning the human race. We're going to talk about how that is different in just a moment. But the question is, who calls us children of God? In other words, who have we received this, this adoption from? Well, if you take a look at Scripture, first of all, God the Father does. Because in 2 Corinthians uh, 6.18 it says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So God the Father himself now thinks of you and has declared you to be his son or daughter. What about the Son of God? The Son does. In Hebrews 2.11 it says, He is not ashamed to call them brethren. So Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, calls us his brethren, his brothers and his sisters. What about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit does, in Romans 8.16, it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, it is important to understand what it means to be the children of God and that everyone is not a child of God in the sense John meant it here. Again, when we speak of respect for human beings and the human race, a lot of times we'll say, well, we're all children of God, you know, so we all should get along and live together. Well, in that sense, it's true. You know, we are God's creatures. God created the human race. We are valuable in His sight. But that's not what is talked about here. In other words, it doesn't mean that we are simply part of the mass of humanity and therefore we're valuable. It goes beyond that. It's like going through an adoption. We literally now, if you're a believer, are a part of God's family, you're God's child, and therefore you have the responsibility and the benefits that come with being His child. He speaks of those who have received Him, uh, who have received the love of Jesus in a life of fellowship and trust with Him. In, first, in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, But as many as received Him, to them he became the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So there is a prerequisite. Yes, all human beings are valuable. We're a part of the human race. We're created in the image of God. We all have rights. But that doesn't mean that in the spiritual...
spiritual sense, in the judicial sense, we are his children. In order to do that, we need to believe in his name. We need to receive Christ as our Savior and Lord. And if that happens, then we are called the children of God. But does that mean we're perfect instantly? No, we are not perfect. And so let's talk about completed children of God. We are called children of God, but it begins a process in our life that someday will be complete. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, let's start out by just reading the phrase that says this. Dear friends, now we are children of God. Stop. So in the present tense, right now, in, 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 on planet Earth, in the nasty now and now, not in the sweet by and by like we talked about earlier, right now we are called children of God. Guzik says our present standing is plain. We can know and have an assurance that we are indeed among the children of God. Romans 8.16 says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If you are a child of God, you have an inward assurance of this. So, right now, God's Holy Spirit comes and lives in the life of a believer. We've been adopted. We belong to Him. We are His child. We have that assurance. But then, in the second part of verse 2, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2b, he goes on to say, And what we will be has not yet been made known. In other words, you're a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. God isn't finished yet. You know, my uh, son Josh uh, works in real estate, and now he's helping out to sell homes at this housing development called Sunset Lodge. It's south of Tyon, uh, south of the fairgrounds. There are houses they've already built, and there's houses they are building, and there's houses that are just a foundation, and then there's lots that they haven't started on yet. So if you go out there, you will see houses that are in progress. Okay, you get an idea of what they're going to look like, but you don't see the finished product yet. Well, we're in process. Guzik says, though our present standing is plain, our future destiny is clouded. We don't know in the kind of detail we would like to know what we will become in the world beyond. In this sense, we can't even imagine what will we be like in glory. Okay? You get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, and you go, oh my. <laughs> you know, as we get older, things get baggy, things get saggy, things start to, to fall apart. Uh, on Facebook... Somehow they know, uh, you know, your, your background, what year you graduate. So this, this little uh, thing keeps popping up. They want to sell me a t-shirt that says, well, I won't say what year. Made in, and gives a year, and says, all original parts. <laughs> Made in, and it says, all original parts, all right? But we're falling apart, you know. And, uh, you know, we think about what we would like to be, what we would like to look like, and we go, oh, my. Well, the fact is that in glory, when we receive resurrected bodies, new bodies, when we're in His presence, we're living with Him, we're going to be a lot different. But we can only begin to imagine what that's going to be like, is the idea. John Stott said, what we are does not now appear to the world. What we shall be does not yet appear to us. So in other words... Jesus said that, you know, they don't know you because they don't know me. So we go out into the world, and the world scratches its head at Christians. They don't understand why Christians do the things we do or say the things that we say. So they don't know us. And yet we don't know what we are going to be like someday. No. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. If I may use such an expression, this is not the time for the manifestation of a Christian's no. glory. Eternity is to be the period for the Christian's full development and for the sinless display of his God-given glory. Here, he must expect to be unknown. It is in the hereafter that he is to be discovered as the son of the great king. So we don't get a lot of respect when we go out into the world. Okay? They look at us as just anybody ordinary. 
we need to realize that we're children of God. We've been adopted by God. We belong to Him. But in the future, in eternity, we're going to begin to see. Now the third part of that verse, so we could call it 1 John 3, 2c, says this. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Most of us would like to be like Jesus. Most of us would like to be more like Him. Again, we have a standard. We realize we're not meeting that standard. But when He comes back for His church, when we're gathered to be with Him, we will become like Him. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be gods. Okay? We're not talking about Mormonism here. But it does say that we're going to be like the one who loves us. The Bible speaks of God's great plan for our lives like this. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's from Romans 8, 29. So God's ultimate goal in our lives is to make us like Jesus. And here, John speaks of the fulfillment of that purpose. So what is beginning now, we're beginning to become more like Jesus. Someday in the future, we will be like Him. And then 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 simply says this. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as he is pure. So we have a hope. Okay? Not only do we know our sins are forgiven, but we have more than just eternal fire insurance. We know we're going to heaven, but we also need to realize that God has adopted us, made us his children, given us his authority, and he wants to work through our lives now, but it's only just begun. Knowing our eternal destiny, and living in this hope will purify our lives. When we know our end is to be more like Jesus, it makes us want to be more like Jesus right now. That's our goal. So ultimately, our hope is not in heaven or in our own glory in heaven. Our hope is in Him. We must never set our hope on other things, not on a relationship, on success, on a mutual fund, on our health, on your possessions, or simply just on ourself. Our only real hope is in Him. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Not only by the fact that He has forgiven us because of His shed blood, if we've received Him, but He wants to transform us. We've become children of God, and we've only begun the process of what He wants to turn us into. So, Called children of God, completed children of God. I was thinking about this. I thought about a button that was popular back in the 1970s. It was called Pabginfwami. You ever heard of Pabginfwami? Pabginfwami, and I found a picture of this button that's still available, stands for Please Be Patient. God is not finished with me yet. And uh, back in the 70s, there was this uh, man who had this Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts, and if you went to his seminars, everybody got a pumpkin for me button. Okay, you're supposed to wear it on your lapel, and people would walk up to you and say, and you'd say, pumpkin for me. Oh, what's that? Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Now, for some of us, we evoke more need of patience than others. But the process, the idea is we are a work in process. God has forgiven our sins. His Holy Spirit has come into our life. He's trying to transform us to be more like Jesus. But someday, we shall see Him and we shall be like Him. In the meantime, we're a work in progress. We need to be patient with one another. And we need to hope that people will be patient with us as He's turning us into people who are like Jesus. Remember our key verse, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, A, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Again, the idea is as believers, we've received new identities. We are now children of God. The question is, when somebody looks at me, when somebody looks at you, do they automatically know who you are a child of? 
Do you look like your father? Are you living like Jesus? Do they see Jesus in you? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this tremendous few verses of Scripture, just three, where John challenges us in such a beautiful way to purify our lives, to be more like Jesus, because that's going to be the end result. Father, we thank you that we're called children of God. Someday we will be completed children of God. But in the meantime, help us to become more like Jesus each day. Father, when people look at us, help them to immediately realize that we are children of God. There's something different about us. And help us to be able to share the love of Christ with them. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, we are going to close our service by singing one verse of a hymn. That is only trust him. Let's stand, shall we? And uh, Mark, the microphone is by you. Hand it back to text. And text will you pronounce the benediction.